Otis Taylor was born in Chicago in 1948, but grew up here in Denver. My father was, um, mother, they were beboppers, they were bohemians. I come from, a, I'm second generation, first generation hip. The first instrument Taylor learned to play was the banjo. He soon rejected the banjo for its perceived association with racist American South. As a kid, I sort of stopped playing it because I started going more towards guitar because I was like, I'm not going to go down south and play banjo. Taylor would eventually return to playing the banjo upon discovering its actual origins with African roots. Like so many musicians from Denver, Taylor drew inspiration from time spent at the Denver Folklore Center that was founded by Harry Tuft. My mother had a ukulele that broke, so I took it in to fix it. And, uh, never came out, basically. He learned to play guitar and harmonica, and while still in his teens, he formed a band called the Butterscotch Fire Department, and later the Otis Taylor Blues Band. A brief sojourn to London in the late 1960s earned Taylor a contract with Blue Horizon Records. Disappointed that they didn't share the same vision around music and creativity, they parted ways and Taylor returned to Boulder where he played with various artists, including Tommy Bowen. In the 70s, I played bass in the a different version of Zephyr when Tommy left and the bass player went to play guitar. Yeah. We had John Alphonse on Congos and Candy Givens. And um, so I played bass for about three and a half, four years, and then I quit music. As the music business changed, Taylor turned away from public performances in 1977 and developed a thriving career as an expert in high-end antiques. During the 20 years he was out of the mainstream music business, he also helped organize, coach, and fund one of the first African-American bicycle racing teams that eventually ranked fourth in the United States. In 1995, at the urging of Kenny Passarelli, inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2017, and a renowned bass player for Elton John and Joe Walsh's Barnstorm, Taylor kicked off his return to performing at the opening of Buchanan's Coffee House on University Hill in Boulder, joined by Passarelli and former Zephyr guitarist Eddie Turner. Audience response was so strong that it served as a catalyst for Taylor's return to recording and touring, with his vision of pushing the blues genre forward with fresh and original songwriting. In 1996, he released his first solo album, Blue Eyed Monster, produced by Kenny Passarelli. According to Taylor, I developed a way of saying something that seemed to be more intense. You can definitely see how I was getting ready to go that way. In 1997, Passarelli produced Taylor's second record, When Negroes Walk the Earth. Taylor earned his first big break with a review in Playboy magazine by the rock critic Dave Marsh, who described the record as minimalist blues in the John Lee Hooker mode. His vocal skills, guitar, and songwriting talents were also recognized in 2000 with a coveted fellowship to the Sundance Composers Lab in Park City, Utah. I mean, with electric, I can get delay. I can do all kinds of really crazy stuff with it. Yeah. When I played electric, like uh, the movie uh, um, Public Enemies, mm -hmm. the song Timmy and Slaves, is a, the sound that everybody hears is electric banjo. They think it's guitar. Mm -hmm. Because you got that high string, it just gives you a whole different sound. In 2000, Taylor released his breakthrough album, White African, on the Canadian label Northern Blues Music, again produced by Kenny Passarelli. His songs confronted both his personal connection to the legacy of lynching in African American history, that of his grandfather, along with social issues of the day. Taylor shocked the blues world with his heartfelt vocal delivery that accentuated his writings exploration of race relations and social injustice. The album earned four W.C. Handy nominations and he won the award for Best New Artist debut. Taylor's next album, Respect the Dead, was released in 2002, and it was again recognized by the W.C. Handy Awards in 2003 with nominations for Best Acoustic Artist and Contemporary Blues Album. The roots of the style that would become Otis Taylor's most recognizable contribution to blues can be found on Truth Is Not Fiction on Telarc Records, released in 2003. Music critics were both enthralled and a bit mystified by Taylor's signature trance blues electric psychedelic style. Truth Is Not Fiction earned a top 10 album of the year listing from the New York Times and was also featured with rave reviews from USA Today, 
The Washington Post, and NPR. And the record culminated in a downbeat critics award for blues album of the year. His next CD, Double V, came out in 2004 and was the first of 11 records produced by Otis Taylor. Double V also marked an increased presence of Taylor's daughter, Cassie, who would become an integral part of his band on bass and vocals. Otis Taylor won the Downbeat Critics Award for the Best Blues Album for the second consecutive year. And the Reader's Poll for Living Blues Magazine awarded both Taylor and blues icon Etta James the Best Blues Entertainers for the year. Three years later, Taylor scored again when Downbeat named Definition of a Circle, featuring Gary Moore on lead guitar as Blue CD of the Year for 2007. During these years, Taylor had learned about the African roots of the banjo and dreamed of a project that would highlight some of the most accomplished contemporary black banjo players. Taylor connected with Keb Moe, Alvin Youngblood Hart, Don Vappy, Guy Davis, and Corey Harris for the groundbreaking 2008 CD, Recapturing the Banjo, which honored the roots of the banjo and simultaneously took the instrument in a bold new musical direction. Otis Taylor is one of those rare musicians in the world who brings such depth and honesty to the topics of his songs and the passion of his voice and playing. The Colorado Music Hall of Fame presented by Comfort Dental is proud to induct Otis Taylor as part of the Going Back to Colorado class of 2019.